advance here. Here we go. So who really needs a defibrillator in 2020? <clears throat> the benefit of a defibrillator in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is influenced by the absolute risk of sudden death. That is that you need to have a high enough risk to justify a defibrillator, and we'll talk about that later on. If we put it into a very low risk patient, they will not benefit. And most importantly, by the competing risk of other causes of death. Overall, in big trials, defibrillators decrease sudden death by 60%. If you take a 2% risk of sudden death with 8% non-sudden death and you reduce that 2% down to 0.8%, that's a 12% benefit of the defibrillator on all-cause mortality. If it's 2% with 1% non-sudden death, it's a 40% benefit. There's also a difference in the efficacy in preventing sudden death. In people with very severe heart failure, you shock the patient and they still die of heart failure or they have a PEA arrest and other things. And the maximum efficacy of a defibrillator is in low risk patient. The outpatient walking across the walking around Green Lake who has a sudden cardiac death episode, they are very, very highly likely to survive that with a defibrillator, whereas a person short of breath walking to the bathroom may not. Risk models may help elucidate the benefit of a defibrillator beyond the NYHA class and the ejection fraction. If we look at the recommendations from the Heart Rhythm Society, these you're all familiar with. EF of 35% are lower due to ischemic heart disease at least 40 days after an infarct, 90 days after revascularization who are functional class two or three if they're expected to live more than one year. 30% are lower if you're a functional class one. The high value statement is that a transvenous ICD has a high value in the primary prevention of sudden cardiac death particularly when the patient's risk of death due to ventricular arrhythmias is deemed high and the risk of non-arrhythmic death is deemed low based on the patient's burden of comorbidities and functional status. We also must remember the MUST criteria, which is non-sustained VT with an ejection fraction of 40% or lower, provided they're inducible. And in non-hospitalized patients, it's recommended not to put a defibrillator in unless they're a candidate for a transplant or an LVAD. You can consider functional class 4 patients if they're a candidate for a transplant or an LVAD, or they're a candidate for a CRT defibrillator that incorporates both pacing and defibrillatory capacities. For non-ischemics, it's largely the same, except we add lamin A and C mutations who have two more risk factors. And something that I have to admit I did not know until reviewing for this is that it's actually a 2B indication for a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with heart failure with functional class one symptoms with an ejection fraction of 35% or lower can be considered. And so often we don't consider those patients and I'm certain it's up to Chris Patton and other people, whether insurance companies will pay for it, but it's actually a 2B recommendation. It's not actually prohibited and then the same thing if you aren't a candidate for an LVAD or other things, functional class four patients are not candidates. So in this guideline, they say there's ICD evidence gaps for patients greater than 80 years old, kidney disease, especially on dialysis and multiple comorbidities. And we'll go into some of those things here. <clears throat> so we have three patients I would like to discuss. And if you were in person, I would be taking votes on this, but we are not. We have a 40-year-old male, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, functional class two, ejection fraction of 25%. They feel invincible because they've never been hospitalized. They're still working. They're an ACE beta blocker, an aldosterone blocker, a little bit of Lasix, normal sodium, and creatinine. Would you place an ICD in this patient? And most people would say yes, although some people may say based on Danish study, they're too well and they would not place a defibrillator in this patient. We have a 72-year-old male, ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 25%, functional class three with diabetes. They've been hospitalized once in the last two years on good medications. They're on Lasix 120 a day, a little bit of hyponatremia, a little bit of renal dysfunction. And the question is, should we place a defibrillator in this patient? Then we have a 75-year-old female, ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction 25%, functional class three with diabetes, who's been hospitalized once on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, Lasix 120 a day, 
hyponatremic and a creatinine of 1.9. If we look at the guidelines, all of these patients meet HRS guidelines for an ICD. But the question is, should all of these patients receive an ICD? So if we look at sudden death and heart failure, as a proportion of all deaths in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it's anywhere from 30 to 60%, and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it's about 25%. If we look at ICD meta-analysis, primary preventions reduce sudden death by only about 60% and secondary by about 50% and reduce all-cause mortality with a primary prevention by about a quarter and with secondary prevention about a third, being 34%. Is there a sudden death annual mortality that patients need to exceed for a primary prevention ICD? I think Danish has raised the possibility that there may be a lower limit of this and we'll explore that. And does the benefit of the ICD vary based upon comorbidities and is it different for different comorbidities and what I'd like you to start thinking about is the proportional risk of sudden death. That is, is sudden death one-third of all-cause mortality or is it two-thirds of all-cause mortality? If we look at defibrillators and heart failure, MEDA-2 came out in ischemic patients who were one through three ejection fractions of 30% or lower, had substantial benefit reducing sudden death about 60% and all-cause mortality by 31%. Jeannie Poole, Dan Fishbein, and Gus Barty led the SCUD-HEF trial along with other, others from here and showed in both ischemics and non-ischemics a 23% reduction in all-cause mortality. Amiodarone was thought to be the poor man's defibrillator at the time and had no benefit. And this led to these being approved for our current criteria, which is functional class two and three, with ejection fractions of 35% or below due to both ischemic and non-ischemic patients. If we look a little bit closer at scud heft, we see that there are some differences. NYJ2 patients had huge reduction of 46% for all-cause mortality with an average mortality about 6% per year without a defibrillator. Functional class three patients had about 11% annual mortality and technically they had no benefit, but based upon the overall trial, they approved it for both twos and threes. Ischemics had a 21% reduction in mortality with P of 0.05. Non-ischemics had more benefit at 27%, but because the p-value did not reach 0.06, some people said it doesn't work in non-ischemics, but the interaction p-value between those was non-significant. And certainly if you're going to be arguing, you could argue that it has much less evidence in functional class threes than in non-ischemics. The Danish trial came around because in Denmark, defibrillators were only approved for ischemic patients. For non-ischemics, they were not approved because they have a lower mortality. They looked at scut heft and they said that p value of 0.06 was not good enough. And they said, we're going to do a trial in Denmark. And the only mechanism to get a defibrillator in Denmark for primary prevention was to be part of the trial. They also said that GDMT has advanced in scut heft and GDMT, guideline-directed medical therapy, reduces all cause and sudden death. And they said, is an ICD still necessary for sudden cardiac death prevention in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? They included patients receiving a CRT defibrillator versus a CRT pacemaker, which is one of the criticisms, and then ICD versus no device in 42% of patients. They had a long follow-up because they had difficulty enrolling of 5.6 years. And at the end of the day, they did reduce sudden death by 50%, which is a little less than what we saw in the other trials of 60%. And when you looked at all-cause mortality, they reduced it by 13%. If you look at the five-year difference, it's about 25%, which is very much like what Scud have showed, but over seven and eight years, the line started to cross. Of course, there are not many patients out there, but the p-value is non-significant. Many people took this to say, we no longer need to place defibrillators in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. If we look at subgroups, the subgroup that I think is most interesting is the first one, and that's age. There was a clear age difference. People less than 59 years had substantial benefit of 49% reduction in mortality, 
59 to 68 was a 25 percent, very much like scut heft, and above 68 percent, there was actual point estimate of harm from a defibrillator. And we'll see that in other trials that older patients do benefit less or not at all from a defibrillator. What has been shown in other trials as well is that women may benefit less from a defibrillator. They actually benefit more from CRT pacemakers. And that's likely due to the fact that in the general population, women have a much lower risk of sudden death and a much higher risk of pump failure death. One of the things that was unusual is you had to have an elevated NT pro BMP to get into the trial. And here, the people that I think of having heart failure, that is having an elevated NT pro BMP of greater than 1177, had no benefit. It is people who had very minimal heart failure who had the most benefit. CRT versus no CRT did not make a difference, although if you look at the point estimate of the no CRT, which would be like scut heft, it's 0.83 and scut heft was 0.77, which are pretty much the same number. So there is a new one that just came out. It's not been published yet, but it was presented at ESC in 2019. And this is the EU CERT ICD Comparative Effectiveness Registry. So they enrolled patients who were non-randomized but entered at the same time in Europe and they use the benefit of some countries have a very low implant rate and other countries have a higher implant rate to try to come up with control groups and ICD groups doing two to one randomization, two to one comparison of the ICD and the control group. They had very high utilization of ACES and angiotensin receptor blockers, beta blockers, loop diuretics, and MRAs. At the end of the day, when they adjusted for the baseline differences, they ended up exactly what the prior meta-analysis was, which is a 27% reduction in all-cause mortality with a defibrillator compared to the control group. If we look at sudden death prevention, it was astoundingly beneficial. You're looking at a 83% reduction in sudden death. And notice the control group is not super high risk for sudden death. They had about a 2% per year risk of sudden cardiac death. <laughs> That's not yet been published, but Marcus Zabel has shared those slides, which are freely available on the ESC website as well. <laughs> if we look at sudden death and heart failure, most risk stratification methods have focused on selecting patients at a higher absolute risk of sudden death, whether that be NYHA class, ischemic etiology, low ejection fraction, LGE positivity, Method MIBG imaging, T wave alternans, or heart rate turbulence. But what I'd like to get across to you today is that the effectiveness of an ICD is dependent not on the absolute risk of sudden death, but rather the proportion of sudden versus non sudden death and a variable ICD effectiveness. What we're told in the guidelines is that patients considering implantation of a new ICD or replacement of an existing ICD for a low battery should be informed of their individual risk of sudden death and non-sudden death from heart failure or non-cardiac conditions and the effectiveness, safety, and potential complications of the ICD in light of their health goals, preferences, and values. Not only that, CMS has demanded that we do a shared decision making for patients receiving an ICD. The problem is we haven't been provided the tools to do that. And what I'd like to do is share with you one of them that I think is available that I have developed along with Todd Dardis and Ramin Shadman and David Linker has done the programming to make it freely available on the web for anybody to use. So here is some of the, what I call myths about defibrillator. Patients that have a high all-cause mortality receive a high ICD benefit. And this is absolutely not true. Made it to develop a risk model within the randomized portion of the trial. And the risk factors that they used were mainly risk factors for death. You had to be, to have benefit from a defibrillator, you had to be NYHA above two, such that one and twos did not benefit. You had to have atrial fibrillation. You had to have a wide QRS. You had to be older, being age greater than 70, and you had to have a BON greater than 26. 
if you were considered very high risk, if your BUN was above 50 or your creatinine was above 2.5. And if you plot it here, what you see is that the patients with no risk factors, that would be our first patient who was 40 years old, functional class two, he had no benefit from the defibrillator. And I've recreated what they have with the annual mortality on the x-axis and the ICD hazard ratio on the y-axis. If you had one or more risk factors, you had great benefit with 60% reduction in all-cause mortality. If you had three, you had a 20% reduction. And if you were very high risk, you had no benefit whatsoever. Now, they then did an eight-year follow-up of their trial. And what you'd like to see is you'd like to see that you replicated this during longer-term follow-up. And the red line here is their replication, and they actually did not replicate their model. So that the lowest risk patients now had the greatest benefit, the intermediate group had less benefit, and the, the higher risk group were similar. But technically, this did not risk stratify patients because if you look at the interaction term, the p-value is 0.08. So certainly a trend for difference, but it was not statistically significant. The twos with stars are statistically different than one. The third one is not different. But people have quoted this risk model and saying it's a great risk model, but it really, it depends how you use the model. Do you use the, the baseline model or do you use the validation model? And it's not clear to me which is the best way to use it. <laughs> We looked at this way back in 2006. It was actually in the original paper, but we pulled it out and then Dari Mozafarium published a subsequent paper looking at how the annual mortality by the Seattle heart failure model on the x-axis changed with the annual rate of sudden death. And what you can see is that in low risk patients, that is people, let's say less than 10% annual mortality, most of their death is due to sudden death. Pump failure death is very, very uncommon until you start getting up into the 20, 25% mortality. Many people think you need to be in this group highlighted to have a high rate of sudden death to benefit from a defibrillator. If you express this a little differently, this is now the proportion of sudden death. If you look at low risk patients below about 20%, most of their death is due to sudden death and not due to pump failure death. And we think that this is the group that benefits the most from a defibrillator are patients who have a high proportion of sudden death rather than a high absolute rate of sudden death. We tested this prospectively, I guess it would be retrospectively, we built the model and tested the model prospectively in Scott Heft. And what we saw if we looked at quintiles of risk by the Seattle heart failure model, that in the lower risk patients on the left side of the screen, those with an annual mortality of less than 5%, the defibrillator was astoundingly effective in preventing sudden death with an 88% reduction in sudden death and an over 50% reduction in all cause mortality. The highest risk patients even though they had a high risk of sudden death, the defibrillator was unable to prevent whatever was causing their sudden death. They had a 24% reduction in sudden death and they had no benefit in all cause mortality. If you model this in other trials, which we have not published yet, but this is definite, which was non-ischemics and made it to, which was ischemics, we are again see for sudden death prevention that people down in the 5% or lower range have a huge reduction in sudden death and the higher risk groups now have about a 50% reduction in sudden death and both of those are significant. If we combine it with companion looking at CRT defibrillator versus CRT pacemaker and we look at all cause mortality we see a very nice non-linear relationship that roughly a 20% mortality, the hazard ratio for the defibrillator disappears even in the companion trial. And at the very highest risk in companion, if anything, there's a suggestion of potential harm. Technically, the interaction for companion was not statistically significant, but when you look at them all together, it's a very uh, 
similar response across all of them and I do need to get Meta 2 and Definite published. I have presented Meta 2 as an abstract, Definite has not been presented yet. So my recommendation is that we really need patients to have a greater than three year median survival to benefit from a defibrillator. That's roughly a 50% survival at three years, which is about a 20% survival at one year. And that expecting to live one year is not necessarily the right criteria to be using for defibrillators. So what about Danish? When we look at Danish, we get a suggestion that there may be a U-shaped relationship and that both for sudden death and for all-cause mortality, that the higher risk patients on the right side, they tended not to have a lot of benefit from a defibrillator. We see the intermediate group having substantial benefit in preventing both sudden death and all-cause mortality. And we at least have a suggestion that people who were very low risk, we're talking about a 2% annual mortality is estimated by the Seattle heart failure model had a benefit for sudden death, but no benefit for all-cause mortality. And this was published in the Danish group, uh, published this in conjunction with myself in 2019 in Jack heart failure. What about some other scores? Well, there's the FADES risk score, which I think they have a lot of things going in the correct direction. They came up with the functional class being functional class three or four has less benefit, age being 65 to 74 and greater than 75, even more less benefit, diabetes being less benefit, very low ejection fraction less benefit, and smoking being less benefit. So they compared shock prior to death. If you received a shock from your defibrillator, that's great. If you died without getting a defibrillator shock, that's bad. They looked at their risk model and risk at five years, and they looked at the treatment by the ICD, which did not vary across the groups at about 30 to 40% received treatment. But death prior to ICD treatment was markedly different. The low risk patients had more ICD treatments than death, the high-risk patients had more death prior to ICD treatment, and they said this is how we should be risk stratifying patients. They approached myself and we ran the Seattle Heart Failure model in this cohort. They ran it in, the, in this cohort. They ran the Meta 2 risk model, and they looked at all-cause mortality and both ischemic and non-ischemics. The Seattle Heart Failure model trying to predict mortality was better than the other twos, which to be Honest, they are not trying to predict mortality, but trying to predict who has benefit. And so they were not designed for mortality models, but they actually did pretty well at predicting mortality as well. They then compared within their group of 2,000 patients who received both defibrillators and um, CRT therapy. You have the light one in, in all the risk models, it's about a 30% risk of being shocked prior to death for the low and high risk groups, whether that's the FADES, the MADIT, or the Seattle Heart Failure Model. And the darker bars is the risk of dying prior to getting a shock. And you can see in their own model that even in their higher risk groups, they still had about equal shocks and death. The MADIT 2, the very high risk, did have more non-benefit, that is they died prior to being shocked, in the Seattle heart failure model, the fourth and fifth quintiles both had more non-benefit than appropriate ICD therapy. And they concluded that the Seattle heart failure model was the best at risk stratifying people who benefited versus non-benefit using this type of analysis. The problem is we don't have a control group to know really about mortality, but at least if you are dying without getting shocked, there's a very strong evidence that you did not benefit from the defibrillator. So if we look at these three patients, we look at the Seattle heart failure model based upon SCUDHEF, the first two patients would benefit. The third patient would be getting into the higher risk group who doesn't necessarily benefit. If we look at the MADA2 risk model as defined by the authors, the first patient would be too low risk to benefit and the other two would benefit. If we look at the FADES model, the first patient would benefit, the second and third one would be in the high risk category and they would not benefit. So the question is, now should all of these patients still receive a defibrillator? And more importantly for the electrophysiologist, how do you actually counsel the patient about whether or not they should receive a defibrillator?
So myth number two is that the high absolute risk of sudden death means high ICD benefit. If we calculate the rate of sudden death taking the Seattle heart failure model, and we'll be talking later on about the Seattle proportional risk model, what we can see in the blue line is that the prevention of sudden death was the same in the four quintiles. The benefit of from the defibrillator actually varied markedly, and that once you got up to about 8% mortality, there was no benefit from the defibrillator in preventing all-cause mortality. If we look at MATA2, we don't have shock rates out to eight years, but we seem see the same relationship that around 10% mortality, no benefit from the sudden death if it's 10% per year. And if we look at Danish, we see a little different relationship, and that is the lowest risk group had no benefit in preventing either sudden death or all-cause mortality, and their sudden death observed rate was down in the 0.7% range once you got up into the 1.4 or the 3.2, you had benefit. If you put these all together, you see a very nice relationship, about a 60% reduction in sudden death across it. But as the sudden death rate increases, the benefit of the defibrillator decreases. And we have that outlier from Danish that down around 1%, there's no benefit either on sudden death or all-cause mortality, but extraordinarily few patients in those cohorts. So what about ICDs are no longer needed in non-ischemic? If we look at a meta-analysis, we actually see that they do have a fixed benefit of about 25% reduction, even including the Danish study. And in the EU CERT trial, the non-ischemics actually had more benefit than the ischemics. So I think that is actually wrong and we need to risk stratify them, but clearly there's substantial benefit in non-ischemics. So how do we actually do this risk stratification? CMS has pointed us to the decision aid from Colorado, and this is what is on their website, which basically is presenting the data from Scudheft as uh, figures, and you don't have any individualized risk about how you're supposed to do this for the patient coming to see you. <clears throat> if we look at sudden death and heart failure with reduced ejection fragments, fraction, this New England Journal article, which has paradigm, they said, look, the rate's getting so low that maybe you don't need a defibrillator. But if you look at the rate from paradigm and Scott half, they're very, very similar. And what we do see is that there's a 49% reduction in all-cause mortality, a 44% reduction in sudden death. But when you adjust for heart failure medicines, it's only a 10% difference. So it's really because people are on more guideline-directed medical therapies that you're seeing a reduction in the absolute rate of sudden death. If we look at the effects of medical therapy on sudden death, this is from an editorial that I did, we can see that ACEs and ARBs and RNAs all reduce sudden death, so do MRAs, and beta blockers are astoundingly effective. Triple drug therapy with an ACE, a beta blocker, and an MRA is as effective as an ICD in reducing sudden death, about 60%. CRT defibrillators are additional benefit, and if we combine a defibrillator with guideline-directed medical therapy, we reduce sudden death about 85%. This is from a, a paper that we just published, and it's plotting annual mortality on the x-axis and annual sudden death on the y-axis. And we start with a functional class three patient with EF of 25% with an annual mortality of 20%, 8.5% annual sudden cardiac death. The ACE inhibitor reduces annual mortality, that is going to the left horizontally, and reduces sudden death, that's reducing Y, the beta blocker, the MRA, and with triple drug therapy, we go from 20% annual mortality to 7%. Sudden death rate goes from 8.5 to 3.5. And then if we add a defibrillator, we go down to a 5% annual mortality and a 1.5% annual sudden death. What you'll notice is that you're all basically on the same blue line. And what you'll see later on is that each individual patient has a different blue line that can be steeper or less steep. And depending on that, they get more or less benefit from a defibrillator. So what about other risk models? There's the bimodal survival and ICD shock model that came out of uh, the Ontario group. And they built a model in their defibrillator database that says shock 
variables that predict outcome are the ones listed, and the death variables are the ones listed here. And I think most of this is correct. The problem is there's no risk model that you can plug this in and say, what is the individual risk for my patient? But older age had less shock. Amio had less shock. Being a smoker had less shock. A wide QRS had less shock. And anemia had less shock. For death variables, being revascularized was less shock. A low blood pressure was higher risk. Low sodium was higher risk. And an ACE and an ARB were higher risk. Um, if we look at this, we have different quadrants and the purple quadrant was the one that they said was the best one that was that they had a high shock rate but a low death rate and um, we don't know whether this is really true because we don't have the control groups to have a comparison but this is the one that they have and they said this is the group that we think is the people who benefit the most but we have to notice that they're absolute risk of death in their cohort was about 5% per year. And it's not been validated that I could find in any other cohorts or randomized trials. And unfortunately, there's no online calculator to let you calculate this for your patient. So what about comorbidities? There's patient level meta-analysis using MUST, made of one and two, definite and scud heft. And the, the comorbidities they used were smoking, ischemic heart disease, CKD, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, COPD, and peripheral arterial disease. Most of the patients had about two of these, and what they did show was an interaction that the more comorbidities you had, the less benefit. But even if you had more than two comorbidities, that's in the three and the four, you still had substantial benefit from a defibrillator. And to be honest, some of these may be going in different directions. That is, ischemic heart disease may actually increase the benefit of a defibrillator, whereas the other ones may decrease it. And they did not test the individual risk factors to see if they differed in the directionality of benefit from a defibrillator. If we look at patients with diabetes, there's a meta-analysis of primary prevention ICDs. And what they saw was that diabetes doubled the risk of sudden cardiac death and all-cause mortality. If that's the case, you would think that diabetics would be great candidates to put defibrillators in because they're at very high risk, and that's what the made it um, preserved higher ejection fraction trial, I forget the name of the trial, they tried that where they put uh, patients with age greater than 65 and diabetes and EFs above 35, and that trial was stopped early for lack of enrollment. But when you look at this, the diabetics actually had less prevention of sudden death. They had no mortality benefit. It looked very much like Danish at 0.87. The proportion of sudden death was actually less and the interaction p-values suggested that diabetics had much less benefit from a defibrillator with almost a thousand diabetics. And you could argue not to place it in a defibrillator based upon the outcomes. If you look at appropriate shocks, even though they had a doubled of the risk of sudden cardiac death, they had a 24% lower absolute shock rate, suggesting that whatever is causing their sudden death is not a tachyarrhythmia, and more importantly, it cannot be prevented by a defibrillator. So what about age? <clears throat> if we look at all-cause mortality, not surprisingly, as you get older, you're more likely to die. Sudden death goes up a little bit, but not very much. And when you look at the proportion of your death due to sudden death, it goes down with advancing age. And that should suggest that the defibrillator would have less benefit. If we look at all these different analysis, there's a network meta-analysis of 12,000 patients. They used a cut rate of age 60. They had a trend for less benefit, but still substantial benefit. The EU CERT ICD had no benefit for age greater than 75, and the Danish trial had no benefit for age greater than 70. So certainly suggestion of less efficacy with advancing age. What about CKD? They put together a meta-analysis of the defibrillator trials again, and the people who had an estimated GFR greater than 60, substantial benefit for sudden death and for all-cause mortality. If we look at the patients with a GFR of less than 60, 32% reduction in sudden death and 20% reduction in all-cause mortality. 
They did a trial recently called ICD-2 with ejection fraction of greater than 35% on dialysis, and they found no benefit in reducing either sudden death or all-cause mortality. And I think what we can say is that ICDs are less effective in preventing sudden death and all-cause mortality with estimated GFRs of less than 60, and there's no benefit in dialysis patients, even though they die of sudden death with EFs above 30, it did not it was not prevented with a defibrillator. I think it's very reasonable to take it to the next step and say, if this is the case, then maybe people on dialysis will not benefit from a, from a defibrillator, even if their EF is less than 35%. Women have less benefit. They have less shocks from a defibrillator. And in this study, they actually, when they put them all together, the men had substantial benefit, the women did not. So can we improve on sudden death risk prevention? If we look at, this is 10,000 patients, the black line is the annual sudden death with age, the red line is the annual non-sudden death, we can see that at about age 65, non-sudden death exceeds sudden death and half ref. The cyan line is the proportion of sudden death and it decreases as well. If we look at renal function, we see the same type of relationship, but the cut point there is about 1.3, is where the non-sudden exceeds the sudden death. An ICD would be expected to be more effective for age less than 60 and creatinine less than 1.5%, where the proportion of sudden death is higher. But neither age nor renal function are currently considered for ICD placements. So Ramin, Todd, and I developed the Seattle Proportional Risk Model, and unfortunately it took us three, four years to get it published but we finally did get it published in the Heart Rhythm Society. And our goal was to say we wanted things, variables that increase the proportion or decrease the proportion of sudden death. And we found that lower ejection fraction and digoxin use increased the proportion of sudden death where everything else, I'm sorry, they, everything, <clears throat> excuse me, lower ejection fraction and digoxin use were the two things that were sort of higher risk heart failure patients that increased the risk of sudden death. Everything else was sort of associated with an increased risk of sudden death, but not necessarily increased in all cause mortality. That is younger age, male gender, systolic blood pressure closer to 140, either higher or lower than that, you had less sudden death, no diabetes, lower NYHA class, higher body mass index, a normal sodium, and a normal creatinine. And if we plot on the log scale, the Seattle heart failure model estimate of one year mortality, and the percent of that mortality due to sudden death, the upper left quadrant is the group where we thought they would have the most benefit from a defibrillator. That is lower mortality that's primarily sudden. If we examine, we take two patients here. If there's a 75% proportion of sudden death and a 25% proportion of sudden death, and the defibrillator decreases this by 60%, we'd have a variable all-cause mortality benefit from 45 and 15%. If it's different efficacy, that is the high proportion sudden death is VTVF that we shock and it works, and the low proportion is PA or other things that is not preventable, we may be a six-fold difference in the risk of and the benefit from the defibrillator. We applied this to Scud Heft, and what we found was surprising to me because we really were not predicting the absolute rate of sudden death that across these four quint quartiles, the absolute risk of five years was the same at about 12 to 14 percent. What's interesting though is if you put a black line on the defibrillator patients for the average in the control group, the preventable sudden death varied with the quartiles. The orange one is the highest proportion of sudden death. They had a huge, almost absolute eradication of sudden death, whereas in the first quartile, the ICD was unable to prevent their sudden death. What we really predicted was non-sudden death, and that the people in the first quartile had a higher rate of non-sudden death than the people in the highest quartile. So we're really predicting a high proportion of non-sudden death rather than a high 
a high absolute non-sudden death rather than a high a higher rate of sudden death. If we plot this on the SPRIM being the x-axis and the ICD hazard ratio from Skedheft on the y-axis, the dotted line is how we think about trials. The quartiles are the points and the solid lines are the interaction terms. These interaction terms are what is actually plotted in the Seattle proportional risk model to give you a benefit for all-cause mortality and for sudden death reduction. And what we can see is the point of no benefit happens at about 37%. At 45%, you have about a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality. <laughs> Very importantly, if we look at people above and below the median SPRIM, with their first shock, those below the median SPRIM, 18% of them died. So there, it was really a terminal event when they were shocked and they weren't able to be prevented by the defibrillator. Above the median SPRIM, only 2% of the patients died. We'd well, like to really have this replicated before you start using it for patients. Um, this is using point estimates for everybody in Scudheft, and you can see that at the same annual mortality, you can have a very different benefit of the defibrillator. And on the right side, you have the life you're saved for a seven-year ICD. And you can see that on average, you're saving about two years of life, provided your annual mortality is less than 10%. <laughs> When we look at a forest plot, we see that the Seattle proportional risk model was very effective in risk stratifying patients, and every single variable as predicted by the model was directionally the same. That is younger patients, ejection fraction that is below 25, functional class two, male, lack of diabetes, blood pressure in the 120 to 150 range, a normal sodium, higher BMI, a normal creatinine, and digoxin use, all of those were directionally this predicted by the model, although only some of them reached statistical significance. If we look at the EU CERT, we see the same type of things in their forest plot. Age less than 75, no diabetes, ischemic and non-ischemics were somewhat similar. Lower mortality as predicted by a model that they built had more benefit functional class one or two more benefit than three or four, and male rather than female had more benefit. So what about other trials? This is Danish, that is now published, substantial interaction term. If you look at above and below the median, the interaction p-value is 0.04 is a continuous one, it's 0.053. If we look at meta two, we have an interaction p-value of, of 0.02. If we look at heart failure action, which is an exercise trial, and we used observational ICDs, those that had an ICD at baseline versus those who never had one, we say the same type of interaction. And if we look at NCDR with observational ICD use, about 80,000 patients, and we provided 10,000 control patients to them for comparison, we see again a very nice interaction with less benefit at lower Seattle proportional risk model estimates. So if we get back to which is the best way to do it, the red line is all-cause mortality. The higher the all-cause mortality, the less benefit. The blue line is higher sudden death. The higher the sudden death, less benefit. And the orange line is Seattle proportional estimated risk. And that is people with a high proportion of sudden death have a greater benefit from the defibrillator, and the interaction p-value suggests that the proportional risk is by far the best way to predict it. So if we plot these, this is now scud heft on the left side and made it to on the right side, and we included a variant of this in a recent editorial that Neil Chatterjee just had published in European Journal of Heart Failure. And what we're showing here is that the people that are in the blue group have a markedly different five-year estimated risk of sudden death, anywhere from 5% to 50%. All of these patients, even though they're markedly different rates of sudden death, had huge benefit in sudden death and all-cause mortality. The red group are all very similar. That is, their rates are very, very different, but their proportion are the same. They had a differential benefit. They had a 
a large benefit in sudden death and all-cause mortality. It's the purple group. That is where the sudden death was not 50%, less than the 50% group. They had no difference, even though they had the same benefit, the same absolute rate of sudden death, their proportional risk was such they had no benefit. Their point estimate was a hazard ratio of 1.10. If we take all the people above the diagonal line, the defibrillator was astoundingly beneficial in reducing all-cause mortality by 44%. If we look at MEDA-2 using the quartiles, they're very, very similar. We see very much the same type of response that the blue group has the greatest benefit and the purple group had no benefit. So can we identify patients who are currently not candidates for defibrillators with EFs of 35 to 50 who may benefit from a defibrillator? We know that if the ejection fraction improves after receiving an ICD, that the rate of treatment by the defibrillator is lower with EFs of 36 to 55% but it's still 2.4% per year. And the people who are truly normal up at 55%, it drops down to 1.7% per year. These patients in the current era generally still get generator replacements, even though they would not qualify for a ICD placement because their EF is above 35%. So what about LGE? LGE was thought to be a great marker for this. LGE is looking at SCAR imaging. They have a 2.4-fold higher risk of all-cause mortality, a 4.6-fold higher risk of arrhythmic events, just like somewhat we saw with diabetes. MIBG imaging looks at sympathetic activation, and they saw the same thing. I was part of the steering committee for Admire ICD, which was halted for slow enrollment, which was looking at MIBG imaging to not put a defibrillator in if they were very low risk. The Danish did a subgroup in about a quarter of their patients, and what they showed was that the LGE positivity doubled the risk of all-cause mortality both in patients with and without an ICD. Unfortunately, the ICD did not decrease the elevated risk associated with the LGE, and in fact, the ICD hazard ratio, the point estimate was higher in the people who were LGE positive rather than lower. There's an ongoing trial called CMR guided, that is EFs of 36 to 50%, 1,055 patients with LGE positivity randomized to a defibrillator are an implantable loop recorder, so you'll know whether or not they have arrhythmias in the other group. That is ongoing, and we'll see whether or not that will be beneficial. So what sudden death rate is necessary for a defibrillator? If we look at Danish, it was one and a half percent. And I think it's helpful to look at the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is the only place they've actually seen a rate. And they said, if you have a 6% over five year or 1.2% per year, consider a defibrillator. If we look at where we plotted these, we can see that that may be the right cut point that Danish at very low rate had no benefit, and the maximum benefit really is a sudden death rate in the one and a half to seven percent range. So can we identify people who have a higher ejection fraction who may benefit? We've looked at GISI heart failure trial, which is 8,000 patients randomized to fish oil, R to rosuvastatin, and placebo, and we found that the Seattle proportional risk model worked very well people who had a defibrillator had a lower proportion of sudden death as expected. And we looked at other comorbidities like stroke, like peripheral artery disease, ischemic cardiomyopathy, COPD, cancer, atrial fibrillation, and only two of them really um, entered into the model. What we saw is that COPD and a history of cancer both were like diabetes that they decrease the proportion of sudden death, and they probably should be added to the model. When we look at people with EFs of 36 to 50 percent in the GISI heart failure trial, we see that there's a very small proportion who are in the optimal group, that is the blue one, but there's a fair number in the red and the green group who may derive benefit, and they had a 6.4 percent actual risk of sudden death over four year, uh, five years, and the non-sudden death was 
if we estimate the defibrillator benefit from SCUDHEP, we'd see a 35% reduction in that group. Now, maybe we need to put the cut point in there at, on the y-axis at 6%, take out the very low rate group, but we may be able to identify some people with ES of 36 to 50 who may benefit from a defibrillator, and this is what was presented at the Heart Rhythm Society last year. Well, what about patients in the HAT AED, which was a prior anterior myocardial infarction randomized to an AED at home or not, and they did not show benefit from the AED? This is an ideal population. We just got the data from Duke in a data use agreement, age of 62, EF of 45%. Sudden death rate was in the 0.7 to 0.8%, and sudden death proportion was 36%. Predetermined, Neil Chatterjee published an excellent article. They were looking for people with EFs above 30 to 35% who may be candidates, and they found it very difficult to find sudden death. The sudden death was down on the 0.5%, and only 20% of the deaths were due to sudden death as far as proportion. HAT AED, this has not been presented yet. If we look at HAT, it looks like the Seattle proportional risk model works very well. The observed sudden death, our cardiac arrest was about 42%. The predicted by the model was about 50%. So a little bit of miscalibration and we, we look at potential ICD candidates, that is people with a high proportion and a sudden death greater than 1.2%. If we look at those with an EF of 31 to 50%, functional class one, our functional class two, our three with EFs of 36 to 50%, the red group are people that we think maybe might benefit from a defibrillator. They had a three-year rate of sudden cardiac death of 3.4%, plus an additional 0.9% of survived cardiac arrest, the people in the blue had a lower rate of sudden death, a lower rate of survived um, sudden death. And what we see is that the proportion of sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest was 56%. So very high in this group. If we plot the predicted ICD hazard ratio from SCUDHEF, we'd expect about a 32% reduction in all-cause mortality. The predicted five-year mortality with no defibrillator is 10.4%. The predicted with the defibrillator would be 7.2 for an absolute risk reduction of 3.2%. Might this work? This is the low-risk quintile in Scudheft, and they had a 1.5% sudden death rate and a 3.3% annual mortality, and they reduced both sudden death and all-cause mortality in this lowest risk group. So if we look at the patient selection, the patient on the left has a 3% per year risk of all-cause mortality. 73% of that is sudden death. An ICD has a ratio astoundingly beneficial, and an ICD would add 5.4 years of life. The one in the middle, intermediate ICD has a ratio suggests maybe a little benefit, adding 0.3 years of life of life, the one on the right, no benefit whatsoever. This can be done with the Seattle Proportional Risk Model available on the web freely, programmed by David Linker. You click the boxes, you come up with proportion of sudden death, the ICD hazard ratio, and the life years saved for the three different patients, and you can provide a patient level estimate of the benefit. If we look at Danish, we see this age effect. If we look at the Swedish Heart Failure Registry, which is 21,000 patients with EFs under 40, and we plot in red the ones that we think derive at least a meaningful benefit with an ICD hazard ratio of less than 0.85. Overall, only 47% of patients would benefit, but in Sweden, less than 10% receive a defibrillator. Age less than 50, it's all patients. 50 to 60, it's 92%, so you can argue they really don't need risk stratification. It's once you get up into the 60, 70, and greater than 70 that you need to really risk stratify. So risk stratification is really needed for age greater than 60. So in summary, patients who do not meet all these criteria may not benefit from a defibrillator. Proportion of sudden death greater than 35%, a sudden death rate of greater than 1.2%, an all-cause mortality of less than 25% per year, that is median life expectancy of 3%. That's outlined in the red line. 
And in the blue line are the people who I think have the maximum benefit from a defibrillator. And the effectiveness of the defibrillator is dependent not on the absolute risk of sudden death, but rather the proportion of sudden versus non-sudden death and a variable ICD effectiveness. This could not be accomplished without collaborations around the world with Art Moss, who unfortunately has died, with the Heart Failure Action Group out of Duke with Yan Hong Lee and Shelby Reed, Scott Haft with people from Duke, including Ann Hellcamp, who is here in Bothell, Washington, but she's an excellent statistician, the Comet Group, the Italian Heart Failure Registry, and very importantly, Ramin Shodman and Todd Dardis, who helped develop the Seattle Proportional Risk Model, and David Linker, who has programmed both the Seattle Heart Failure Model and the Seattle Proportional Risk Model. Thank you very much, and I will entertain